Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Welcome to Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage. Today is part two of the great James Burton. When we come back, James Burton. Uh, Frank Pace said, horse, you need to go out and tell the folks something because, I mean, they're going to tear this place down. And uh, so Horace walked out there and he walked up to the mic and he said, ladies and gentlemen, Elvis has left the building. And then they started doing it from then on? Well, yeah, uh, we had a guy that would go out with us. Uh, he was like, an, uh, he kind of reminded me of an old circus guy, kind of like Colonel Parker, you know. But uh, he would go out and after every show, he'd walk up to Mike and say, Ladies and gentlemen, Elvis has left the building. Speaking of the Colonel, what what was your take on Colonel Parker? You know, I, I didn't really have any uh, problems with Colonel. You know, everything was good. Uh, of course, I didn't have to answer to the Colonel. I didn't work for the Colonel. I worked for Elvis. So, uh, but uh, the Colonel was nice to me. I didn't have a problem. So, I hate to bring up something like this, but you know, you were in the band when. When Elvis passed, what happened? What was that like for you? Well, what was the yeah, what was it like for the band? August sixteenth, and uh, I was in uh, I lived in Toluca Lake in Burbank, California, and uh, um, I had I went to Burbank to get on. Our, we had a private plane, and we flew to Las Vegas and pick up our conductor Joe Gershow, and singers and musicians. And so anyway, when we left Las Vegas. That morning, we were flying out to, our first show was in Portland, Maine. And uh, man, I don't know, we were in the air maybe 15, 20, 30 minutes. And um, you know, you can get quite a ways down the, down the road, uh, down the air uh, in a plane, you know. So they called from Vegas and said, return to Vegas. The pilot, but they didn't tell him why. So anyway, um, the pilot said, well, I have to stop and refuel because I can't just turn around and go back. So we stopped in Pueblo, Colorado to refuel. And so I got out and I walked outside the plane and, um, and the trombone player, Marty Harrell, Marty came up to me and said, James, I'm gonna go call Vegas and see if I can get a, you know, find out something. I said, oh, okay. So my wife was in Louisiana. I, I called, uh, I was gonna go call her and I didn't make it to the phone. Marty was on his way back and he came up to me and he had tears in his eyes and he put his arms around me and said, Elvis died. I couldn't believe it, man, it was like a shock, you know. My, it was, I couldn't believe it, I said, is this a joke? He said, no, for real, and because the, the thing that came to mind was Vernon. His dad had been sick with the heart problems. And I thought it maybe something happened to Vernon. But it was th this particular time, it was Elvis. I mean, it was a sad flight back to uh, Vegas. We get back to Vegas, and I had a home in Vegas, and I was going to get off and stay there, um, knowing my wife was in Louisiana. I said, no, no, I'm going to go back to my home in Toluca Lake in Burbank. And uh, Jimmy Wakely, a good friend of mine, the cowboy, Jimmy, picked me up at the airport and it was raining. It was really a sad day. And uh, he took me to my house and he said, James, I want you to come spend the night with, with me and uh, Inez, his wife. I said, man, I don't know. I, I really need to get on the phone. I want to see if I can get a flight to Memphis. I got on the phone, Joe, I called every airline I could think of and they were completely booked up. I talked to a girl with American Airlines and uh, she knew me She she because she was a big fan of Elvis. She said, James, I, I got 500 people on waiting list, but give me an hour or two and let me see what I can do. So she called me back later and she said, you got an 11 o'clock flight tomorrow morning and don't be late. 
and I went and got on that plane, flew to Memphis, and uh, it, it was a it was a very sad thing, you know. I walked in the house, and um, I called my wife and I said, "Meet me in in uh, Memphis," and so she did. No, later I picked her up later at the airport, and uh, Priscilla wanted to take me in uh, in that room where they had Elvis in the casket, and I. Um, I didn't want to do it. I said, I'm going to wait till my wife gets here. And Ann Margaret was there. Ann was in the room with the Elvis. And she would go in for maybe three or four hours and then come out and, and go back in. That that long? And in, in, in there with it? With, oh, way. Yeah, James Brown, man, he was in there for hours. He, 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 I don't know, I think they had to pull him out. He didn't want to leave. And uh, Ann Margaret was in there a long time. And, yeah, it was just uh, God, can you, all the people driving down the funeral concession, going to the graveyard. Streets were just lined up with you, you, thousands and thousands of people. Just amazing. It was sad. You know, my wife and I went. We were in like the third, third, I believe, third or fourth to white limo, following the you know, the hearse to the, you know, J.D. Sumner and the stamps, they were all there. And it, it was just, it was a sad day. Well, I'm going to take a break and when we come back, we're going to talk about something a lot more happy. The Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum has been celebrating the men and women who make the music of our lives since 2006. The Musicians Hall of Fame is the one and only museum in the world that honors the talented musicians who played on the greatest recordings of all time. It's a music city, huh? It's, uh, I mean, where else are you going to get the cats, all the cats that are in this room? The Grammy Museum Gallery at the Musicians Hall of Fame is an interactive facility that allows guests to explore the process of making a recording. Take drum lessons with Ringo Starr. Sing on stage with Ray Charles. Write a song with Desmond Child, rap with Nelly, or be Garth Brooks in our recording studio experience. Located in the heart of downtown Nashville, in the first floor of the historic Nashville Municipal Auditorium. Come see what you've heard at the Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum. Dream Events and Catering is Nashville's leading full-service event and catering company. Grounded in exceptional customer service, creative expertise, and dreaming big, we imagine your next event as memorable, meaningful, and delicious. Welcome back to Musicians Hall of Fame backstage with James Burton. So, Ricky Nelson, would you tell the story of how you guys met? Well, I was uh, working with a great country singer, Bob Lumen, and uh, we were working on a song, My Gal is Red Hot. And... Um, you know, Ricky was on Imperial Records and Bob was on Imperial Records. So we were actually in Hollywood rehearsing at Lou Chud's office, the owner of Imperial Records. And the music director, uh, Jimmy Haskell, was working on the TV show with Ozzy and uh, uh, the recording sessions with Ricky and everything. So anyway, we were rehearsing this song, My Gal is Red Hot, and it was pretty cool. And uh, so Ricky came in on business and uh, he wanted to know who was playing in the next room. So uh, Jimmy Haskell brought him in and, you know, he listened for about three hours. We should not have him but playing all kinds of stuff, having fun. And uh, the next day we had a telegram. We had a home in, uh, it was in Canoga Park in the Valley in California. And um, uh, we had a telegram on the door and uh, James Kirkham went out to get the newspaper that morning, and he found the telegram. And uh, Ricky invited uh, James Kirkham, the bass player, and I down to uh, the studio, General Service Studios, and uh, to meet his dad and uh, the family, you know, Ozzy and Eric. So anyway, Ozzy came in, and we we had our instruments with us. And Ricky said, uh, you think we could do a song for Dad? Yeah, said, sure, why not? And Ozzy said, yeah, do a song for me. So we did a couple of Elvis songs like Mystery Train and kind of, you know, just kind of mixed it up a little bit. And uh, Ozzy said, wow, this is great. Uh, do you boys want to do a, 
a song on a TV show. And um, that was our first uh, in introduction to the Oz and Harry show. But that was actually before I joined him as his lead guitar player. So we did a few shows, and James Kirkland and I, we got homesick and wanted to go home. This was during the Christmas time. But Ozzy said, man, I'm going to keep the crew on. I've never done this before. I want to keep the crew, and I'll pay you guys triple. Uh, stay in, and let's do some uh, more stuff for the TV show. And we said, no, no, we're homesick. We're going home. So James Kirkland and I went back to Louisiana. I was home maybe two weeks, and I get a call from Ozzy to uh, join Ricky as his lead guitar player. And he said, I'll send you a telegram. If you accept, uh, just sign the telegram, send it back to me. Hey, I'm 16 years old, why not? And so what happened then? Well, I, Ricky called me on the phone and said, uh, can you come out tomorrow? I said, well, no, no I'm not quite ready. But, but uh, you know, anyway, we worked it out when I could go out. And uh, uh, mother didn't want me to leave, of course. You know, I was 16 years old, and she didn't want me to uh, go to California. But I figured, this is a great opportunity. I'd love it. I, I want to go for it. I want to try it. So I, actually, I went out, and Ricky picked me up at the airport. So we go. they had an apartment for me. We go to my apartment. And they put everything in the apartment, and and uh, Ricky uh, said, Mom and Dad wanted to invite us to dinner tonight. Is it okay? Do you mind doing it? And I said, Sure, that's okay. So we went to the Oz and Harriet family, the real house where they live, you know. And um, so anyway, we're we're sitting in this, like this beautiful living room area, with the with our trays, and uh, the food comes through the trays, and and Harriet said. James, uh, I cooked uh, one of my favorite uh, chicken dishes. I would like to, uh, like to know how you guys uh, eat chicken in Louisiana. She said, we, out here, we just pick it up and eat it, you know? And I said, well, we do pretty much the same thing in Louisiana. But it was very interesting. And uh, after Ozzy finished his dinner, he said, uh, he got up and excused himself. He said, uh, uh, James, uh, I'm going to go up and work on the script for the show tomorrow, but Harriet and I and the boys would love to have you stay in our home, and you and Ricky can work on your music, and, and we have a, you have your own room, we have everything, you know, and you'll be the third boy in our family. I said, oh, sure, that, that's great. I, I loved it. It was great. And uh, Harriet would cook my breakfast every morning, put it in a special oven that kept the temperature just perfect. And when I'd get up maybe four or five hours later, <laughs> my breakfast was ready. But you know, uh, and Ricky would, uh, or someone would come pick me up if if the cars were all gone or something. He said, uh, you know, go out and if there's a car there, get in and come over to the studios. What a life for a it kid, was, man. It was wonderful, you know. and. Uh, uh, Ricky and I, we were sneaking out at night, and Ricky would always forget his house key, and he have to climb up <laughs> to the second floor a window and go in. But uh, I was just said, now, Rick, don't stay out too late tonight. you got an early call tomorrow morning for the TV show. But that was fun, Joe, doing the TV show, uh, really interesting. And uh, Did they compensate you well for that? Yeah, yeah, it was fine. You know, uh, um, it was... Uh, well, you know, I got paid by the week, very weekly, but no. No, it was, a, it was a, hey, for 16 years old, man, um, it's a lot better than having that paper route. <laughs> You're throwing papers, you know. No, no kidding, yeah. But uh, they were great, uh, the, the whole family, and having fun. Um, Rick and I working on songs. I remember Sharon Sheely knocking on the door 20 times a day. Oh, Ricky, you got to do this song. You got to do this song. Well, it was a song called Poor Little Fool. Oh. And an in interesting story. And Ricky turned it down 10 times. She kept knocking on the door. This one time she came and she was standing there crying. Ricky, it's a hit song for you. You've got to do it. Well, uh, PJ Proby, Jet Powers back then, he had so many names, uh, uh, PJ Proby now. But PJ could sing like Elvis. 
and he would do the demos. They would cut demos and send them back to Elvis. So anyway, the demo was up tempo, you know, and everything. If you heard the demo and and the song the way we did it, two different songs. So we took the. I told Ricky, take the song and let's work on it and fool with it. She wasn't even coming. We completely completely rewrote the song, changed it all around. And uh, so anyway, we went in the studio, recorded it, poor little fool, and uh, pretty interesting. So when Sharon Sheely heard it, she came on and said, I love it, I love it. It's different, but I love it. <laughs> and uh, Ricky, uh, oh, she said, I, I will split writers with you. And Ricky said, no, I don't want writers. Well, that was cool. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you hear the demo and the, the way we rewrote it and recorded it, it day and night. Well, you know, that happens a lot. You know, as, uh, as a writer, I know that the I was privy to having a, a decent song come out really great because of the the players, you know, and the producer, you know, so that happens, you know. So... Um, how long did that last with uh with Ricky? I was with Ricky maybe eight and a half, nine years. Uh actually I the the way I had uh, sorta of made it an exit um uh, from Ricky and I didn't it was not really I, I was not looking for an exit, but Johnny Cash called me to do a TV show and I wanted to do it. He said, I want you to play Slide Dobro and I said, Sure, I'd love to do it. But Ricky said no. Ricky didn't want me to do it. Was that the Johnny Cash show that was filmed here? No, this was the Johnny Cash uh, doing a TV show in L.A., ABC. And uh, you're going to be shocked when you find out what it is. Anyway, I worked it out with Ozzy, and the manager. And um, um, we went in and did the show. And Johnny came in the studio, brought me a... 1945 uh, National Dobro, dragging it on concrete. I said, Johnny, you can't do that. But anyway, we did this show, and it was that TV show was Shindig. No kidding. 1964, and uh, Jack Good, the producer, Jack said, "Oh man, I'm a big, I'm a huge fan. I love all those solos on Ricky Nelson records." And I said, "Well, thank you, man." He said, "I want you to be on the show every week." Well, not knowing uh, what was going to happen on the Ricky thing, you know. I said, well, well, what do we do? And Jack said, hey, let's put a band together. So uh, Glenn Harden and I worked together a lot, and uh, also Delaney Bramlett. Delaney was a bass player and singer, and the rhythm guitar player was Joey Cooper, and the drummer was Chuck Blackwell, a friend of Leon Russell's. So we we were... <laughs> We were the shin dogs, and yeah. so we got 90% of the songs on the show. Really, I think that you with, with uh, Ricky are credited for creating the first music video. Is that not true? Um, that would be a traveling man? Yeah. Ricky, you know, uh, was a great, great artist, uh, and traveling man was a top-notch record. And uh, when they put their little video segment together yeah all the different scenes you know um it, it was a good record so i guess that's gonna maybe go down as the first music video then that was it, it yeah yeah i i didn't know till later but someone told me yeah that was the that was the very first and that's the hist i guess it would uh would that be more history i guess but also on the ricky nelson show the bass player was your buddy Joe Osborne, correct? I hired Joe in 1959. Uh, Ricky and I had a tour to Australia, and we were sitting in the commissary having a hamburger, Coke, and a chocolate malt, Rick's favorite meal. And we're sitting there, and at the same time, we look at each other and say, man, we got a tour in two weeks, and we don't even have a bass player. So I thought, I said, let me make a phone call real quick. So I called Joe in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. Yeah. I called Joe and I said, Joe, I'm sitting here with Ricky Nelson and we sure would like to have you 
think about playing bass with us on a little tour coming up. And uh, he said, well, yeah, I'd like that. So I put him on the phone with Ricky and uh, we put it together. He was already a bass player? <clears throat> no. Well, he was then, yeah. Joe was a guitar player when I met him, but he couldn't get he couldn't get work uh, for some reason. And all the guitar players, me and Billy Sanford and uh, maybe a couple other guys, we had all the work sewed up in Shreveport, which wasn't very much work. Mm -hmm. But uh, Joe couldn't get a job playing guitar, so he switched over to bass. Man, all of a sudden, he's working with everybody. I guess that's why he played with a pick because he yeah. was a guitar player first. And that's how, yeah, with a pick, yeah. And so um, here's a question I'd like to know, because, you know, we have his bass here. Right. We, we, we bought it from Joe that was on all those records. You know, I mean, he didn't change the strings on that bass. That was the one, you know, for 14 years. No, you know? he would send a message out. If any bass players are throwing their old strings away, here's my address. Send yeah. them to, to me. Well, you know, they said that he got Leland Sklar's some old strings from Leland. But he said once his original strings just finally would not tune up anymore. Uh, the the other strings just never had the same sound. Yeah, they stretch out so much, you know, they lose. But he had, you know, that, those those strings getting dead over time on all those hit records from the Carpenters through the uh, Bahamas and Papas and all that. Um, he said he was he changed them one time on a Carpenter session and the first note he hit, Richard Carpenter hit the top back and said, uh, put the album Joe back on. and I were at Al Casey's music store that night. We were going in to do a session and Joe put a new set of strings on his bass. We got to the session, and boy, he hated it. And he called out. He said, don't close. I'm coming back to get my old string. No kidding. I'd say I'd a really true story. I was cool. there. Yeah. Well, that was it. You know, yeah. Because, yeah. So how did he get that guitar? Were you there when Mr. Fender? I understood Mr. Fender came by and gave it to him on the set of the Ozzy and Harriet show. Is that true? Yeah, uh, jazz, the jazz bass. The jazz bass, he, yeah. Before it ever hit the catalog. They brought in the Precisions. By the way, I've got a brand new 58 Precision, and everybody in the world wants it. Even Joe wanted it. But I said, no, I'm going to hang on to it. Brand new 58. But Joe played, the. he liked the neck on the jazz bass. Bass and it was a, the sound uh, was amazing. Do you know how he how he acquired it? Is, is, you know, how well, I was I've been with Fender for well I guess since 1955, Leo, and I, I'm I know, and I can't remember if Joe and I went to Fender and he picked one out or if they brought it to him. I can't remember exactly. Either. I thought he said that that uh, that Leo came by the set and gave him that guitar before they were ever even in the catalog. Well, it wouldn't have been Leo because Leo never left his off office in uh, Fullerton. Mm -hmm. He was always down there experimenting with stuff. But there's a possibility that one of his guys uh, that would have came by. Artist promotion yeah. people, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they, they did that a lot. They did that with... Uh, Leo gave away so many guitars. Well, it the movies. Bases. You know, I mean, that was brilliant. I mean, because they're still advertising Fender in movies that were made in the 50s and 60s. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Joe, you know that uh, Jimmy Bryant, a great guitar player, uh, Jimmy would um, help Leo. Uh, Leo would build something, take it to a club where Jimmy was playing, and ask him if he'd try it out, you know. Uh, so Jimmy Bryant was like the first guy to play the telly. I was the second. I just found an interview that I did with Bill Carson. Did you know Bill? Yes, very well. So we're going to put that out on on our little side uh, vault, the vault series uh, t show that we that we do. But uh, you know, Bill tells the story of working with with Leo, and <clears throat> he wanted Leo to make him a guitar. And he tell, tells a story of how he sawed the telly, bot, uh, the telly side and the yeah. back to make the contour and all that. And he, tells, he told me that, that there was two or three players in L, L.A. That, that Leo, since Leo didn't play, had to depend on players to tell him what they right, needed right. or what was right or wrong on it. And he was one of them. I know where Leo uh, would call me and ask me uh, different things about it. And um, when I 
As a matter of fact, when I was working in Vegas with Elvis in 69, yeah. there was a guy named Forrest White that worked for Leo. Right. Forrest White came to me after the show that night, and he said, James, I'm Forrest White. I work for Fender Guitar, and um, I noticed your guitar could use a paint job. So you bring that, he gave me his card and said, bring that guitar to me and I'll, any color you want. And I did. And I remember going to Fender and while I'm talking to Forrest and I think Leo was there, the guy was taking my guitar apart. And I said, hold, hold it. Um, do you have a little bag here? Take all my hardware off and I'm taking it home with me. You know, because I didn't want anything changed on my guitar. Right. So I took everything, and when, when the guitar was painted and ready, I went down and we put the hardware back in it. I mean, you played with, you played with John Denver. What was the, how did that come about? Well, um, you know, before Elvis died, uh, I was, I was, uh, I had a call to do a TV show, John Denver. And uh, he had a couple of artists on the show, like Johnny Cash, he had, uh, um, he had Glenn Campbell, Roger Miller, Mary Kay Place, and it was a big show. And he said, um, he said, I sure would like for you to go to Australia with me on this tour I got coming up, and uh, I'd like for you to do an album with me. So I said, well, if Elvis is, you know, if we're not on tour with Elvis, I'd be glad to, I'd love to do it. Anyway, very shortly, not even two months, Elvis passed away. And uh, of course, I, when I got back from the funeral, uh, my phone, I had 35 messages on my phone. It was crazy. Uh, Waylon Jennings, Merle Haggard, I had all these calls of people call, call in to pay their condolences about Elvis. And anyway, John, John uh, had about 15 messages from John. A few days later, uh, they didn't wait for me to call them. They called me back and said, um, I'm going in the studio, RCA, to do uh, the album. That first album I played on was I Want to Live. I Want to Live. And I got to tell you, it kind of touched home, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, when it was a great album. And, you know, uh, Jerry Weintraub was going to go on tour with us with Elvis. And he paid Colonel Parker one million dollars to go on that tour. That, you know, it was actually, you know, when Elvis died, August 16th. And the show, that, but that tour that was booked, you're not going to believe this, but when I went to work with John, the very first tour that Jerry Weintraub booked John on was that same tour that Elvis was booked on, opening show in Portland, Maine, and then on and on. But that was the that was supposed to be in the Elvis tour. Jerry was going to take Elvis to Europe. Elvis had never uh, played out of the country except for Canada. So that was what Jerry Weintraub was putting together. Uh, I have the schedule that was booked for Elvis. And when we did the John Denver tour, the same schedule. Same schedule, yeah. James, thank you so much for doing this. I, and um, maybe we'll do another one in another 15 years. Joe, we will. <laughs> thank you, man. God bless you. Thanks again, and well, thanks for watching Musicians Hall of Fame backstage.